So the Hubble Space Scope allows us to see very far into space. Um, we, our our Earth-based telescopes had recognized these very intense sources of radio waves called quasars. In fact, if someone asks, what's the most distant object we can see? Quasars. What is a quasar? It's a very high intense source of, of um, radio waves. It's a radio source. And uh, they developed a theory about what's producing these jets of radio waves uh, and what could cause them to, to travel so far that we can see them. And uh, the theory had to do with a galaxy, a collapsing galaxy into a black hole. Uh, it's absorbing the energy and radiating back into the, uh, into the night sky. The problem was is that we couldn't see a galaxy because we were looking through all the crud in our atmosphere. But when we got the Hubble Space Scope out there, we could test that theory for the first time. And what they discovered was that around these quasars, that's a quasar, what do you see? A galaxy. So does that prove it? No, it doesn't prove the theory, but it makes it more plausible. And it is uncanny how scientists can do that. They can come up with theories and they're actually right. It's called induction. We studied that philosophy, the deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. The deductive <coughs> is when you have a few, when you have a statement, general statement about a population, from that general statement you can make specifications about members of that group. It's a, what you would call a, a specification. Induction is different. Induction is when you have a few samples and you can extrapolate that to the whole group and actually be right. Um, just guess, generalize, and it works. The problem with the induction, or the induction problem, is how would you prove it? How do you know that it works? Well, someone could say, well, we know it works because we tried it and it works. Induction works because we tried it and it works, so that proves induction, but what have you just done? It's circular in that you just use induction to prove induction, right? In other words, you're saying, well, it's worked a few times when we try it, so we'll assume that it works all the time. But we don't know if it works all the time, so we haven't tried it all the time, so we're actually using induction to solve the induction problem, and that's cheating. So you can't do that. All right, so quasars. What are quasars? I think this is a test question, too. I'm trying to point out these test questions, so I know it's, we've been here a while. Very intense source of radio waves. They're so intense that they can travel... Um, billions of light years. I think they estimate 18 to 20 billion light years away. How far is 20 billion light years? It's very far. <laughs> very, very, very far. It's uh, the distance that light travels at 186,000 miles per second, traveling for 20 billion years. So that's, yeah, that's a lot. What do you mean but by that's, intense? Yeah. Well, intense enough that it can create a radio wave that travels through space for 20 billion light years. Anyway, this is, um, what you're seeing here is a halo of x-rays that's occurring along what's called the event horizon of this black hole that's embedded inside the galaxy. So the quasar, the theory was that you have a large galaxy and there's a black hole inside of the galaxy and that black hole is pulling in all the matter of the galaxy and that's what creates the energy source that you need. Uh, you've heard of Stephen Hawking, very famous physicist that's in a wheelchair. And, uh, this is one of his discovery, or one of the things that made him so famous. You're wondering, what's the big deal about this Stephen Hawking guy? Well, according to his equations, he predicted that if there was a black hole, <coughs> that it should have a halo of x-rays that are emitted along what's called the event horizon. And uh, when they got the, the Hubble scope out there, they began to see this uh, halo of x-rays, which is exactly what he predicted. So that's pretty, that's pretty uh, uncanny. He can make a prediction, they can find it. And it also makes more plausible that, that there is a black hole. Is the uh, atheist rock the You read some of his early works, A Brief History of Time and things like that. I don't think he would be considered an atheist then. He's more agnostic. You have to be very careful, though, when you hear physicists talking about God because they'll mention God, but they're not talking about any kind of personal concept. It's just sort of a concept or an idea that they have to explain away certain things like why there's something instead of nothing. All right, so event horizon. 
Let me talk about black holes. A uh, black hole, what is it? It's just a very, very massive star. In fact, the, a black hole is so massive that it creates a gravitational field that's so strong that nothing can escape it, not even light, which is traveling very fast. And so there is a certain distance away from that massive star or black hole to where the gravitational field is weak enough that light can escape it. And that boundary is called the event horizon. So when I say event horizon, that's what it's referring to. Any light ray that comes within the event horizon will will be inevitably sucked into the black hole. And what happens to the star when it starts pulling in all this debris? It becomes even more massive, which makes the gravitational field stronger, which pulls in more debris, and it sets up a sort of feedback. Any object or light ray that's coming outside the event horizon will be bent by the gravitational field. It will be pulled off course, but it will not be sucked into it. Okay, So that's the event horizon. So does, does, the, does the event horizon get bigger as the black hole? As it sucks material in, the gravitational field it gets more massive. The gravitational field gets stronger. The event horizon moves outward. Um, we have no um, we have, have no concept in in science of anything that would be called anti gravity. Anyway, in, in other words, there's not something of the same phenomenon is gravity that works in the opposite direction, okay? And most physicists, I think, assume that that's the case. They've given up on this concept of anti-gravity that counteracts gravity. But you can see the conundrum, can't you? If the universe was infinitely old, in other words, if we say that there was no beginning to the universe, if someone were to say, well, I believe in God, but I also believe in the universe, and the universe is coexistent and co-eternal with God, they exist together. There was never a time when there was not a God, and there was never a time when there was not a universe. So that means that the universe is infinitely old. Well, if the universe is infinitely old and there's no such thing as anti-gravity, you see the problem, right? There's nothing to counteract gravity. Then what you're going to have eventually is all these black holes just getting larger and larger, right? Then they're going to begin sucking up other black holes, and they get more and more powerful, kind of like Highlander, you know? They won't be the one when you're killing off all the immortals. But eventually, they're just going to be one, so they're going to begin sucking up all of these black holes, and eventually, it's just going to be one gigantic mass. It's inevitable, right? If there was never a beginning, and the universe is infinitely old, then it shouldn't be like it is now. It should be just one giant mass. It shouldn't be distributed like it is. And so, that's just a, that's an argument that shows that there was a beginning that's completely separate from the Big Bang, because it's not all together. So the universe can't be infinitely old. If it's not infinitely old, it must have begun at some time. Einstein, he really struggled with that. In his equations, he had something he called the cosmological constant. And someone would say, well, what's this cosmological constant? And he put it in there just to keep everything separate. And he was really happy when Hubble came up with his expanding universe theory, that the universe is expanding, because that's what keeps everything apart and doesn't cause it to collapse. But the expanding universe is what led to the idea of the Big Bang. If the universe is expanding, we rewind everything, and it all comes back together into a point, which is where the Big Bang is. But we'll talk about that in much more detail when you get to the cosmology section, more detail than you want. Anyway, you see the galaxy? You see the jets coming out of the center? So very energetic stuff going on. Uh, this is one person's perspective on what a black hole may look like. If it's sucking up light, it would just be like a black void. Any light that should be coming to our eye is not coming to our eye. It's being pulled back down into the into the, the uh, star. So you have this massive star inside, then you have the shell around it called up to the event horizon where no light can escape. And so it would look sort of like a hole, and you would fall into it. What would happen if you fell into a black hole? That's the question Parker asked earlier. Um, <laughs> well, you would, you would begin to approach the velocity of light. And as you move faster and faster, you, time would be dilated. It would slow down for you. And uh, you would become really long like spaghetti. So it would be you, but you would be like a long string of spaghetti. And you'd become extremely heavy. <coughs> That's what relativity would say, because the speed of light will always have, always remains constant. Did we talk about that last time? E equal mc squared, the c is the speed of light. And it's, it's denoted by c because it's the 
ultimate constant. It's the only constant. Everything else changes relative to C. So to keep the speed of light always constant, then things have to get longer and shorter, and time has to get faster and slower to make sure the speed of light always stays the same, no matter how fast something's moving relative to the speed of light. And so as you fell into a black hole, that's what would happen is you would just stretch out, and then eventually you would become part of that mass and cause the gravitational field to become larger. Of course, you have been dead a long, if you're in space, you're dead anyway, just a big chunk of ice. So it'd be like a long spaghetti popsicle, I guess. <laughs> Here's another star. You can see the jets coming out of it, much like you would see in a black hole, except in a black hole it would be pulling it in. Do we know what the largest black hole is? Do we know that? Do we have a way to the thing is, is, again, we haven't ever seen a black hole directly. You can see the problem with that, right? If the if the object's actually absorbing not only its own light, but any other light that comes near it, then it's not we're not going to see it. The reason we see something in space is because there's light that's escaping and coming to our eye. You know, it's it's. I was telling my wife this the other day. We were out at Lake Winsboro this summer, and I was looking up the Milky Way, and I thought about what science is actually saying about it. It's really uncanny. When I look up at the Milky Way out in the countryside, and I see this tiny, tiny star. That means that the reason I'm seeing is because there's some photon that's going into my eyeball, right? Some photon has gone into my eyeball and hit my retina. They caused some kind of electrical impulse that went to my brain that interprets that star. Isn't that right? And so that photon that hit my retina that came into my eyeball, where did that photon come from? It came from that star. Must have, right? That's just an awesome thought. So that photon's been traveling through space for who knows how long, just to go into my eyeball, just so I could see that star. It's wild. It's <laughs> 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 just going out in all directions, like just a spray of energy so that you can see it. And the problem is, if you have a black hole, it's absorbing that spray of energy, right? The energy's not going out, and so therefore, it's hidden, it's veiled from us, because no light's coming from it. However, you, you could detect a black hole indirectly. There's, there are several ways. I'll ex try to explain two of them. Um, most of the stars that we recognize um, are binary systems. That means that there's two stars, two suns that are moving around each other. You've seen Luke Skywalker in the, the first, what was it, uh, what was the first Star Wars called? Uh, Something hope. New hope. New hope. The new hope. Remember at the very first the new hope when he goes out to look at the sunrise or the sunset? It's like two suns. Yeah. Well, it's a binary star system. Two suns. And most stars are like that. And so if I'm holding stars on my fingers here, they would do something like this in a dance. This is a binary system. And so you can see as they come close together, the gravitational fields are calling them a slingshot around each other. See that? And that's how they move. And so you can see those two stars. Well, sometimes they'll see a star, one single star, but it's doing this. So what's that suggesting? There's something right here. That's just slinging that star out in space. Can you see it? No, but it must be massive. Extremely massive, but you can't see it. So are you seeing a black hole? No, you're not seeing it, but you're seeing the effects it has on another star. Another thing has to do with uh, what we're looking at here. This is a deep field. Like I said, what looks like stars there are not stars, they're galaxies. Each of those dots are billions of stars, all congregated into galaxies. Why, why would it push it Galaxy, over? galaxy, 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 <laughs> galaxy. That's a galaxy. This is a galaxy. <laughs> they're all galaxies. I'm sorry, question? Why would, why would the star be pushed away from the black box? Because you said it was pulled in too, mm -hmm. too earlier. Why would it be pushed away? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's, it's outside the event horizon, so it's not being pulled into it, but it is being affected. Here, let me, let me uh, show you. I'm going to show you time lapse, okay? Ready? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's going to lose energy. As it's losing energy through time, it's eventually going to be pulled down. 
So this is a deep field. You're looking at galaxies. They can, you can't see it with your eyes, but when they begin to process the information coming from the deep field, they can see that certain galaxies and certain bands are actually stretched. And they can take that information and they can, something like this, this is where they've exaggerated. So you can, you're able to see it. So you look something like this, your eyes can't really detect it. But if you begin to exaggerate it, you can begin to see this lensing effect. See how this galaxy is really stretched and they form sort of a circle pattern? I think I've got one where I show it. Here. You can see them here. See that? That's a stretched galaxy. And they're forming sort of a, here it is. This is where they've emphasized it. You see these streaks here? That's a galaxy. It's a, it's a normal galaxy, but it's been, it's been smeared. It's been compressed. And it's, it's called a lensing effect. And, and what they believe is there's a large black hole right here. And there's light coming from distant uh, galaxies. The galaxies that we see inside of this are the ones on this side of the black hole. There's objects on the other side that's being pulled into the black hole. But right here along the event horizon, there are galaxies that are beyond it. But as they're getting close to the black hole, it's bending the light. It's lensing. It's causing the light to bend, and that's, that's causing it to compress, like a lens. And so when you begin seeing this lensing effects of distant galaxies around some object in the center, that, that's another bit of indirect evidence that a black hole exists. If you could actually go close to it and see it, it would look something like this. There's the black hole. It's absorbing. There's nothing in the foreground between us and the black hole to show up. They did that intentionally, just in terms of the diagram. These are objects that are beyond the black hole. There's other objects here that are beyond it, but they're not making it to us because they're being absorbed by the black hole. But these objects are just barely um, making it around the event horizon. See? And that's stretching them out. So that is what you see here. All right? Yeah, Nicole? What would cause a black hole? Well, um, when we get to star formation, in the cosmology section, I'll talk about the theories they have about different sizes of stars. Um, um, <coughs> red giants, white dwarfs, and so on. And generally, black holes are stars that, when they're when they're developing, they become so massive that their gravitational field reaches that critical state where it's so intense that light can't escape it. So instead of radiating light, it absorbs light, and it's just a part of this, the theory of stellar evolution. And uh, I don't want to go into the answer right now because it would take too much time, and we're going to cover that in cosmology. And so if you'll let me, I'll just put that off. And then after that, if you still don't understand it, we can talk about it. But it's just the fact that gravity is pulling everything together, and there's enough stuff in that vicinity to make it very massive. Yes. Out of curiosity, is it, would it be possible to, to determine our location in relation to that possible black hole? Um, Interesting. I'm, I'm sure that astronomers, they have different ways of measuring distances. I don't understand them. Uh, the, we normally hear it, uh, the distance as light years. But why understand astronomers don't use light years. Light years is a term, the sort of a colloquial term for sci-fi, people talking, teaching elementary astronomy. The astronomers themselves use a term called parsec, a parsec, which has to do with how um, the parallax, when they look at different stars relative to others. Uh, and they can use that to determine distances. But how it's done, I don't know. Just not smart enough to grasp it. Uh, I can explain parallax, which is the geometric technique that's part of the equation. If you, uh, if you hold your finger out in front of your face, and you look at something on the other side of your finger, sort of put your finger in front of whatever it is beyond it, and you close your right eye, then close your left eye, then close your right eye, then close your left eye. See how your finger shifts, changes, it's changing relative. Now, if you take your finger, instead of holding it out at arm's length, I have to hold, if you have, instead of holding it out at arm's length, you bring it right up into your face, close to your face, not right at your nose, but maybe a couple inches in front of your nose, and you do the same thing and close your eye and open your eye, you see how it shifts more? And so they can see parallax with stars from, um, you know, from spring on one side to fall on the other side, that means you're on, you're on different sides of the sun. Each year we go around the sun once. Dr. Cooper likes to say how many times he's been around the sun. I've been around the sun 51 times. How many times have you been around the sun? 
Well, that's a year. And so, um, in that circuit, at one point you're on one side of the sun, on another part you're on the other side of the sun. When you look at the stars, you can see them shift, parallax, just like that. And using that, they can begin to get an idea of how far apart they are, how far they are from us, how much parallax they have. 